the first responder program covers um, basic first aid, bandaging, splinting, um, some basic emergency medical services skills, whereas the EMT program enhances those skills and you learn more procedures and you also learn um, how to administer certain medications and then also more in depth of anatomy and physiology and also assessment. And that is the certification that you're gonna to need to be able to work out in the field as an EMS provider. So as an EMT, so, you know, say you're on a private ambulance until if you wanna to go to paramedic school and then you wanna start looking at fire departments. Um, generally every fire department, you have to be a paramedic to work for. Um, so it's preferred that you you know, have the paramedic license. It's not necessarily a requirement um, for the city of Chicago, but for the suburbs, it pretty much is. Um, so it's it's a good career path going from first responder to EMT to paramedic. Um, not, not, not everybody necessarily has to go through first responder. Uh, we recommend first responder if you're not sure what your career path is going to be or if you're not sure if you want to enter the field and commit to the EMT program because the EMT program is more in depth. So I'm still waiting a little bit to um, try and go through the PowerPoint. Yes, Larry, you are good to share the presentation if okay, you'd like awesome. to hear from your own. Awesome. Sorry about that. You Thank know, you all yeah. for your patience. This never happens, so I appreciate it. Happen, we are know. recording and right. I'll share this out at the end of today's session as well. All right, so I'm gonna start with the little video that we have and we'll go from there. Hello, my name is Harry Myers. I'm the EMS program director here at Malcolm X College. I work with our instructors to run the first responder, EMT, paramedic, con ed, and fire science programs. <laughs> Normally we have a classroom up on the seventh floor and we utilize a simulation lab up on the eighth floor as well. So what's been different with COVID is obviously we have had to pivot and make accommodations so that we can go ahead and deliver the didactic as well as the practical testing because as we all know, a paramedic has to put hands on a patient. What's really different here is that we've taken over the conference space and what we would do in our lab, we are now doing here. The uh, instructors, we had to go through all the equipment, bring down what we needed, make sure we had everything here so that we can socially distance. And the space has been incredible. We've been able to remain safe. So we were able to finish up the spring semester and, and actually bring a new cohort in uh, for each of the programs. But what we did is we cut them in half or less to make sure that we could maintain the social distancing um, and keep everybody safe. Maggie Murphy, I am in paramedic with Chicago Fire Department and I am also one of the EMS coordinators here at the Malcolm X College Paramedic Training Program. Uh, we also have American Heart Association CPR classes and uh, EMT and paramedic first responder courses. Today we have been filming our uh, 227 Paramedic Field Internship Preceptor Workshop. This preceptor workshop enhances the wonderful work that the Chicago Fire Department paramedics do to assist our students as they complete their training to become licensed paramedics. Malcolm X, in its dedication to the pre-hospital environment, uh, has a student that can begin as a first responder. We also then have emergency medical technician courses, which is the basic level, and there are three separate uh, course offerings at different times of the day for the student that wants to continue on. Malcolm X's paramedic training program is approximately one year long. We have partnered with the Chicago Fire Department and we enjoy a cohesive relationship and our students get to ride for the full 24 hours with dedicated preceptors. In addition to that, every week the students are here on campus with the resource hospital coordinators. The seminar, as it is known as, consists of reviewing the runs, critiquing the patient care that they were able to perform, and enhancing their education from an in-field perspective. The field preceptors are fantastic. They're experienced paramedics, and they give our students an incredible experience out there. It takes and accumulates all their education into the internship so that we end up with a really strong 
paramedic student who meets all the minimum requirements and can go ahead and get licensed. And then with the whole idea here is that you're training the person who's going to be your partner in the future. And uh, again, the, I can't thank the preceptors in the region, uh, the 227 instructors, Maggie and Carrie, for putting this workshop together to go ahead and make sure that our preceptors are well-versed and can deliver great education while the students are in the field. Okay, so that was a little introduction video. So it was geared a little bit more towards paramedic, um, but it kind of shows you what our program looks like. We are right now using the conference areas on the first floor um, because of COVID, you know, we had to reduce our class sizes. Um, I was, you know, I, I came up with a plan to try and increase the class sizes. So we actually were able to successfully increase them to 30 students and you know, so that helped bring more students in. And obviously we're able to do it safely because we have enough of an area. Um, for the summer program, we, we are actually full um, for the summer program, um, but we do have seats available for the fall program. The fall program more than likely will, we will be returning to the seventh floor for our classrooms, obviously depending on what happens with, um, with COVID. Um, but we have things set up with that being said, our numbers are gonna stay lower. So right now our program is capped at 15 per class. I do not know if that number is gonna increase. We're gonna to have to see um, because we still have to be mindful of social distancing. So I'm gonna talk about the program. I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint and then I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have at the end, okay? Okay. So this slide is going to show you kind of who our staff is. Um, you saw Harry Myers in the video. He's our program director. Um, you met me. My name is Larry. I'm the coordinator for the EMT program. And then here's a list of our instructors. Um, Kevin Ward, Bob Karen, Al Sullins. Um, Chris Easley is a little bit more involved in the paramedic program. He's a clinical coordinator. Um, so he sees the clinical sites for the paramedic program. And then Dr. Weber is our medical director for all of our programs. So as an EMT or a paramedic, you wind up obtaining an EMS license. So it gives you the ability to function as an EMT paramedic. But generally what you're doing is you're working under a doctor's license by working in, a, in a, what we call an EMS system. So Dr. Weber is our medical oversight for the programs. And he's from Stroger Hospital of Cook County. So I'm not sure exactly what everybody's background is and how familiar people are with what EMTs and paramedics do. Um, but basically what we do is we respond to people's emergencies. Um, somebody that calls, you know, 911 and something's wrong. You know, they're having an asthma attack, somebody's not breathing, they're having a heart attack or chest pains. And we go out in ambulances and we respond to the scene. Uh, we perform an assessment. We perform treatment on scene. We get them stabilized. We transport them to the appropriate facility, whether it be an emergency department, a trauma center, um, a psychiatric hospital, um, OB hospital, you know, they're having a, a baby, um, stroke hospital, what we call STEMI or heart attacks. And we provide all that treatment in route. And then when we, once we get to the hospital, we uh, transfer care to that person, to the nurses and the doctors. And so that's what we call definitive care. So it's, there's a little bit of information on the slide, but that's basically generally what we do. So as an EMT or a paramedic, you have to be a strong person, um, both physically and mentally. 
Um, it's a two part um, breakdown of what we do. Sorry, I'm trying to clear off my screen. So the physical part of it, you know, it, it's a physical job. You're not behind a desk, you're out in the field. You're going up and downstairs, in and out of houses, carrying equipment, carrying patients around. Um, you have to be able to lift at least 125 pounds by yourself and or 250 pounds with a partner. Um, we're also in different positions as we work. So, you know, we might be crouching, kneeling, bending, twisting. You know, I don't know how many people that have ever heard of the finding, oh, they found it between the sink and the toilet. It does happen, you know, we find people in precarious positions and so we have to sometimes get in the precarious positions as well. Um, the emotional part of it, we have to be very adaptable to an unpredictable situation. One of the things that I really like about this job is we don't know what we're walking into and no matter what the call is, what's going on, we have to deal with it. You know, we have to figure it out and we have to get it to a point where everything's going to be okay. You know, we have to take care of somebody. Um, this can be unpredictable, can be stressful. We have to be able to monitor our own emotions. A lot of times we're doing multiple things at once and we're also handling a lot of different people at the same time. So you have to be able to, to be able to work with uh, patients, family members, bystanders, anybody basically on the scene and be able to effectively manage an emergency scene with your partner. Not everybody can do this job. Um, like I said, it takes a strong individual that has a willingness to be able to help people. Um, with this willingness and the strong personality, we do face our own challenges. You know, we go on, on, on bad calls and we see a lot of things that normal people, you know, do not see and should not see. Um, but it's what we signed up for. So with that being said, we have to have the ability to recognize our own mental health and be able to, you know, help us, help our partners develop coping strategies so that we can continue, you know, after that bad call and we can move on and keep doing the job that we're doing. So it is not a job for everybody, but we like to... You know, we like to get as many people involved as we can. So our admission guidelines, um, pretty simple. You have to be at least 18 years of age. You have to have at least your high school diploma or GED. You have to have or be at a college reading level. So how we determine this is either you've completed English 101, which is a college English course, or you take the uh, placement test, the reading placement test, which is offered by the city colleges. So if you've taken English 101 and you've completed that course, then what we need to have are your transcripts. So wherever, wherever you took your class at, if it was the city colleges, it should be pretty easy. If it, can I ask you guys to mute yourselves, please, if you haven't already done so? Thank you. Um, so we have to have your transcripts sent in. So most colleges do do electronic transcripts. That's the preferred method because the paper transcripts do take a long time for the college to process. But we need to get your transcripts in showing you either have taken English 101 and you've completed the course or you can take the placement exam. So once you take the placement exam and you, you successfully complete that, then you can um, take the EMT 101 course. Um, if you don't have those courses, you can also take English 100. And then once you complete that program, it's the one EMT 100 is one semester, then you're eligible to sign up for EMT 101. And then we just like to go over the course ex expectations like we are now. So when you come to college, um, generally for most college classes, we just, require college appropriate attire. Um, when we go, when we send you to the clinicals, you're gonna be required to wear a uniform. Every day when I go to work, I wear a uniform. It's pretty straightforward, it's navy blue pants. I've got a navy blue shirt with, you know, my patches on it for the fire department. And then you're gonna have something similar to it. So what you're gonna have is a 
a pair of navy blue pants. We usually wear navy blue cargo pants, so ones with the pockets on the sides. Um, you ha you will have to purchase this separately um, from the program, and then you'll also have to get a plain gray polo shirt. Okay, can't have any on it, anything on it. It just has to be plain, and that's our school uniform um, for females and even males. Um, the hair, if it's longer, it has to be up off the collar. Um, this is a professional aspect. It's also a safety concern. Um, navy blue pants, like I said, your Malcolm X ID, your stethoscope, your watch, and your uh, a pen and paper for notes. So one of the things that I really like to cover is during the program, you're going to be involved in patient care. Um, in the field. You're going to be riding on ambulances. You're going to be possibly going into hospital emergency rooms. And so you're going to be interacting with patients and you're going to wind up with privileged information. There are times where we are, you know, we, we wind up taking care of all different types of people. Um, we've taken care, I, I've taken care of famous people um, and they're entitled to their privacy. So no matter what you do <clears throat> out in the field, what you see, what you hear, what you, who you interact with, it's all protected by something called HIPAA. So Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This act has been around, as you can see, for a long time. So what this act basically says is, as a patient, you're entitled to your privacy. So if you're a healthcare worker and you're taking care of somebody, you have to respect their privacy. So you can't go on Facebook and be like, hey, guys, look who I just took care of and post their picture and explain their situation or post anything identifiable on social media. Um, there are first responders, EMS per per personnel, hospital personnel who have gotten into a lot of trouble for doing such. Um, they've lost their licenses. They've lost their jobs. They've had lawsuits against them. Even some of them have gone to jail for this because it's a federal law. So we have a zero tolerance policy with that. Just want to put that out there. The other thing that I want to talk about is as a student, you're entitled to your privacy. So there is something called the FERPA Act. So it's the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. With you being 18, being an adult learner, you're entitled to your privacy. So if you come to Malcolm X, and you enroll in the program and you're in a program and somebody from your family, your friend, whoever it is, a lot of times we get parents, hey, how's my kid doing? I, you know, we're paying for this. I wanna know how my kid's doing. Well, unless you sign a FERPA, what we call a FERPA release and you authorize us to talk to them, we can't talk to them either. So you're protected as a student, just as well as patients are protected as patients. So in order to complete the program, you have to attend all the classes. Um, we have a policy where we can never, we cannot have any more than three unexcused classroom absences. So the National Registry and the state of Illinois require us to have a certain amount of contact hours with you guys. So that's why you have to attend all the classes. You have to successfully pass all your practicals so your practicals are gonna be the hands-on portions of the class that you're gonna be responsible for. So when you come to class, you're gonna have your lecture days where you are sitting in class and we're explaining the material that you have already read before the class. And then you're gonna have your hands-on your practical days. So we're gonna demonstrate the skills that you're gonna to need to learn to be an EMT and then you're gonna get tested on those skills. So you have to pass all those. You have to do your clinicals. So it's 25 hours of clinicals. Um, it's basically broken down into sep two separate ambulance ride times. One is with the Chicago Fire Department and one is with one of the private ambulance providers that we have with us. Um, you have to at least have a final a midterm and final grade of 75% and you have to pass the final exam with a 75%. You also have to have your CPR certification. 
the CPR certification that we need you guys to have is the BOS Healthcare Provider course that is offered at Malcolm X on Saturdays. It's the first Saturday and the last Saturday of every month. So we offer it twice a month. It's a one day class and that's gotta be completed. And then you also have to go online and take what we call NIMS classes. So NIMS stands for National Institute of Man, um, I'm sorry, National Incident Management System. And these are three classes that go over the incident command structure of what we use out in the field. So these are free classes. They can be done at your leisure. We recommend that you complete them prior to entry into the EMT program. That way your main focus is on the EMT program. We also recommend that you complete the healthcare provider certification. That way that's out of the way as well. Um, and then clinicals and passing the program. And then when everything's done, we'll recommend you that you wind up taking their national registry. So in order to get licensed and work as an EMT, you have to complete the program. You have to have a current CPR card. You have to have a driver's license and you have to pass the national registry exam. So the national registry exam is a separate test that you're gonna take after you complete the program and that's gonna get your national certification. The national certification is just that. You can take it pretty much anywhere in the United States. And then if you wanna work in a certain state, every state is a little bit different. They're gonna have some requirements. They may just wanna see the card and your CPR card. They may have you take a test. Every state is a little bit different. For an Illinois, once you complete the program, you obtain your national certification. We send in your national certification, your CPR card, some paperwork, and then for a 45 hour fee, you're gonna be able to get your Illinois license and then you're gonna be able to work on an ambulance as an EMT. <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about COVID. So when COVID first hit, we had to shut everything down obviously. And then we've slowly been reopening. So we went from having no classes at all to a hybrid course. So the hybrid course, basically what happened was students were at home on Zoom for any of the lecture days. So you didn't come into class, you only attended the class on the hands-on days. So that limited contact with it. Right now, we're at the point where there's vaccine or there, there's vaccines out there. All of our students are getting tested on a weekly basis, but we have the ability to return to the classroom. For the summer, I still see this happening to where we're in class. Um, we do have students, for whatever reason, if they can't attend, or, you know, for instance, you know, maybe you were around somebody who may have had COVID, or you may have symptoms of COVID, then what we do is we have you attend online, and then you can come back to the class when it's safe to do so. So that's kind of what we're doing with that. <clears throat> So a little bit about developing you guys as a student. So whenever you guys come, are coming into the program, you guys are all novices, okay? You, don't, you may or may not have any experience about the medical field, the EMS field. Generally, we expect you not to. So what we do is we take you and we teach you everything that you're gonna learn as an EMT, and we're gonna get you to the point where you're first learning it, to where you're practicing it, to where you're good at it, and then hopefully you're gonna be able to be an expert in your field and you're gonna be able to give back to students. You know, we all were in your, in your uh, shoes at one point. You know, I was an EMT, went to EMT school, became an EMT, worked as an EMT, um, became a paramedic, you know, started helping out with the programs and then I've slowly progressed to where I am now. So we're gonna be doing this through the classroom time, the clinical time. So again, we're gonna bring you in from the novice. Do you need to come in? Um, so if you need to come in from a novice, oh, if you need to come in. Oh, hi, I got your CPR stuff. Yep, 
So sorry. Um, to where you're the advanced beginner, to where you're competent, and then uh, again to where you're proficient and to, until you're an expert and you can come back and actually teach. So a couple of different ways that we do this is we have goals. We have to evaluate your cognitive or your knowledge ability. And how we're gonna do that is through you attending lectures and then you, you taking written exams. Then we also have to evaluate what we call your psychomotor or your hands-on skills. So like I said, you're, what you're doing is you're coming in, you're practicing your hands-on skills, and then you're gonna be tested on those skills. What we also look at is your behavior. So like I said, this job takes a strong individual to do this. Not everybody can do this job. We have to be able to evaluate you to make sure that you can function under stress. So during the class, we're gonna put you in scenarios that are stressful to make sure that you can mentally and physically function under that stress. We also have what we use are standards. Um, so standards are basically the same guidelines that any EMT would be. So no matter where you work or who you work for or how long you've been in EMT, it's the same standard for everybody. So how we evaluate you guys, the written test, we're gonna grade, okay? And then this is an example of the scoring form that we use for the physical or the hands-on portion. So everybody is measured against the national standard. Students aren't measured against each other. There's no competitive with this. Um, so that's how we successfully develop you as a student and we can successfully evaluate you. So one of the big ways that we have to do this, obviously we don't have a lot of sick people around here, so we have to simulate a lot of stuff. So what we do is we go through simulations. Obviously this was a while ago, this was pre-COVID, um, but these are our paramedic students managing a pediatric cardiac arrest. So they're you know in one of our simulation rooms and they're going through the procedures, working as a team, and then they're all working together to take care of that person. So this is kind of where we're at right now. This is our conference area. So as you can see with COVID, everybody, we're socially distancing, we're wearing masks, and we're set up to where we can successfully run the program, get you guys the education that you want and need, and then also keep everybody safe. And then once you go out to the field, you're gonna be out working on ambulances. You're gonna be helping the crews. You're gonna be taking care of real life patients. You know, calling in radio calls, going over documentation, getting feedback from preceptors and hanging out on the streets where it's really fun. It's a really, it's a great job. It's a great situation. It's a great environment to work out. So the application process is pretty simple. If you are not currently enrolled as a city college student, we need you to enroll as a city college student. And I can go over that enrollment process after this. And then once you get your transcripts in, we need to get you enrolled into the program. If you need to take the placement exam, you can do that. And then any other documents that we need.